title is Silence, Deep State, Royal Power and the Constitutional Court. Because I actually use my study of the Constitutional Court as evidence of the existence of what I call the Deep State. So, I'm going to start. This is my, this is my outline, mm -hmm. so it looks uh, very... <laughs> Um, very dense. I will try to make that as simple as possible, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to look at how, first of all, how the Constitutional Court was introduced to Thailand, how its role evolved in, uh, in history, in recent history, and then how we might conceptualize the Constitutional Court in the future as a substitute king, sorry for the, uh, here, the substitute king, yes. Here and then, it's very much at the end that I will explain about the deep state, right? So you have to, I'll, I'll have to keep you waiting so that you don't fall asleep in the be in between, right? So there, are, um, I identified uh, roughly four phases in the history of the Constitutional Court. So first of all, uh, it was introduced in 1997 as part of the 1997 Constitution, and at that time, I argue that the Constitutional Court was thought of as an insurance mechanism. So I use uh, a theory by Tom Ginsberg, um, who writes um, extensively about the fact that the Constitutional Court is usually imported and used in constitutions because it ensures constitution makers and insurance against the future. So if constitution makers um, are in the future part of the opposition, then they will have this Constitutional Court as an insurance mechanism to safeguard their interests, right? Phase two and three, I use, um, so I identify this as a judicial empowerment, which, uh, which, is, which happens in 2006, and then judicialization of politics unfolds from 2006 onwards until the military coup in 2014. So here I use a theory uh, by Ron Herschel, who wrote about constitutional court as hegemonic preservation tools. So it's the idea that whenever uh, democratization is um, under process, threatened elites will choose the constitutional court to safeguard their interests. So actually it's a little bit, it's, a, it's a one step further from uh, Tom Ginsburg theory. Right? So it's not only an insurance against alternation to power, but it's um, a way to, ins to insulate preferences in a definitive way from the rise of democratization. Okay, everything is gonna become clearer as I speak. And then the, the fourth phase, which is starting now, and has uh, been, there were several attempts to make this phase start before now, is uh, to transfer the powers of the Constitutional Court, of the king, sorry, onto the Constitutional Court. So to create a Constitutional Court as a substitute king in the post Bumipo era. So after succession, we will need to have some form of moral authority and this will be the Constitutional Court. All right, so first of all, you're all familiar with the vicious cycles of uh, Thai politics. Um, so basically coup d'etat interim constitution that gives all powers to the military leaders. Then in the interim constitution, you have the promise or the, uh, the um, the mechanism that is set for the drafting of a permanent constitution that will allow elections to happen, then the permanent uh, constitution is promulgated, you have elections and then a crisis and then a coup d'etat, right? So uh, the 2006 and the 2014 military coup d'etat were actually um, similar to previous sequences in which you had a coup, an interim constitution, a permanent constitution, elections, crisis and back to a coup. But what is different in 2006 and 2014, and that's how the deep state is going, concept is going to be useful, is because we have in between the elections and the military coup d'etat, we have the use of the constitutional courts in what uh, some might call judicial coup d'etat. So here, this is the use of the courts. The constitutional court, first of all, but also other courts. Once again, I think you're familiar with the sequence of how the military coup d'etat happened in 2006 and 2014. But I want to, I'm showing you this, um, this table so that you can see clearly how 
the courts have played a major role in paving the way for the military coup. So in both cases, we had an election, then we have street protests against the elected leader, <coughs> then the elected leader dissolved the house, snap elections are organized, boycotted by the opposition, Based on this uh, boycott of the elections, the elections are ruled unconstitutional by, uh, the, um, by the Constitutional Court. Then it's uh, after that that we have a, a few differences in 2006 and 2014. In 2006, after the Constitutional Court ruled the election unconstitutional, what happened is that some election commissioners who were seen as favorable to taxing were sent to jail. So here we have the role of the criminal court, not only the constitutional court, but also the criminal court in helping to pave the way for the military coup because those election commissioners, they wanted to rerun the elections in, uh, in constituencies in which there were problems. So we would have maybe uh, managed to exit the deadlock if those election commissioners had not been sent to jail by, the, um, by, the, by decision of the criminal court. In May 2014, it's a little bit different. It's not the criminal court, but the Supreme Administrative Court that kind of helped uh, pave the way for the military coup uh, as, a, as, a complementary, um, as complementary to the role of the Constitutional Court. So what happened? Uh, in May 2014, the Prime Minister Yinglak uh, transferred uh, one civil servant, Tawil Pliancy, from one post to another position. Um, the uh, admin Supreme Administrative Court ruled that this was illegal because the uh, motivation or the reason for the transfer in the Administrative Act were not uh, sufficiently um, made, so it was not the right reason that was stated from moving this civil servant from one, one position to another position. So based on that, then the... Um, oh, sorry, I didn't put it here, so it's in between uh, March and May. And that's based on that, that the Constitutional Court afterwards dismissed Yinglak, saying that she had uh, done something illegal, as the Supreme Administrative Court said, therefore it was incompatible with her function as a Prime Minister, so she had to be dismissed. Right, so here you have the Supreme Administrative Court. And then we go back to having the same sequence, military coup d'etat, temporary constitution, and permanent constitution. Except, of course, in the case of 2016, or, or in the case of 2014, the time between the temporary constitution and the permanent constitution is two years, as opposed to uh, not even a year in 2006. And even though we don't know if we're going to have a constitution, because maybe there will be no referendum if the constitutional court <coughs> says that the referendum law violates the, uh, uh, the constitution. So this is uh, unclear. Anyway, you see we have the same sequencing and we have a very important role um, of the Constitutional Court in paving the way for the coup, sometimes with help from Criminal Court or Supreme Administrative Court. Right, so this is what I'm gonna... Of course, you know their faces. So I didn't know exactly who uh, would be in this, uh, in this room, so I think uh, I don't need that. Okay. <clears throat> So here you see we have uh, these uh, same sequences. So the question is how, how come do we have a constitutional court that, is really, that really seems to work against um, democratization in uh, annulling um, elections and paving the way for military coup d'etat? So let's look a little bit at the history of the constitutional court. The constitutional court of Thailand is um, prima facie, something that is very liberal, very independent. Actually, it's copied from the German model. So what happened is that in 1995, in Thailand, they studied ways to, um, to have a constitutional court looking at foreign models. So they commissioned the uh, Democracy Development Committee that was um, chaired by Prawet Wasi, commissioned uh, studies of for on foreign models, and here, uh, the one on the Constitutional Court, they studied, for instance, Germany, Austria, France. But they didn't go for the French model. You know the French model, the French Constitutional Council is not very powerful, as opposed to the German uh, Constitutional Court. So they really went for a German Constitutional Court that was to be powerful and very independent. So how is it independent? When we look at Constitutional Court and we want to assess uh, them, we look at how independent their selection is. Are they dependent on the political party and the elected government or not? 
So here you have a map of uh, or a chart of how the constitutional court judges are selected. So this is, I'm sorry, this is from 2007, uh, not 1997, but actually 97 and 2007 are the same, except that you have more, you have 15 in 1997, 15 uh, member of the constitutional court, and uh, you have nine in, 2000, in 2007. So it's not the same numbers, but it's the same. You have more than half of the numbers that are selected by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Administrative Court. So no interference of uh, the elected government or any government. It's really internal uh, selection from the judiciary. And then for the other one, you have a selection committee. So in 1997, as part of the selection committee, you, have some, you had some political party representatives. So you had a small number of people representing the political branch, but then the other people were uh, university um, deans of universities. And then they select only less than half of the members of the constitutional court. So here, if you're a comparative constitutional scholar, you're like, okay, the constitutional court of Thailand is really independent, right? Okay, so then moving on. Is it an insurance? Okay, so who drafted this constitution uh, in 1997 and who were the main, um, the main advocates for the importation for the import of the constitutional court? So here I identified someone I'm sure you know who is Bowen Sakuwano. So he was the one, if you look at the constitution drafting minutes, you will see that talking about the constitutional court, 90% of the time he's speaking. So he's the one speaking all the time in the constitutional court, saying what has to be said and people kind of just accept um, what he says. So he completely dominated the process of importing the constitutional court in the 1997 uh, constitution drafting process. Right. So how is that an insurance? Well, it is an insurance because in 1997, it was the beginning of democratization. So no one had a clue what would happen after 1997, what kind of dem democracy we would have, what kind of leaders would be elected, what, what kind of political parties would be formed. So having a constitutional court is uh, a way to mitigate, mitigate the risk associated with emerging democratization. Let's say there is a fascist party coming on, then the constitutional court will be able uh, to go to rise against that party to dissolve the political party, right? So this is an insurance. Also, uh, there are personal interests uh, at stake. So I, I use uh, John Elster um, theory of uh, constitution making. John Elster talking about constitution making identify uh, three types of interests. What he said is that basically constitution making is about the interest of the constitution makers. So interest of the constitution, of the personal interest of each individual constitution maker, group interest of the group um, that drafts the constitution, and institutional interest of the institution that drafts the constitution. So here the personal and group interest the personal interest is uh, maybe to have a role in the future in this uh, constitutional court. Uh, the group interest would be to give uh, a stronger role to legal jurists, I mean, not well, legal experts or jurists in the, uh, the Thailand of the end of the 20th century. And then institutional interests here are uh, uh, quite uh, hard to find, so um, this, this, this would not work. But individual and group interest uh, are represented here in the person of uh, Bowen Saku Wano. So here we really have this idea of insurance in uncertainty as to what is coming next. Next, what happened? 2006, two, we have the military coup. Uh, 2007, we have the permanent constitution. And this uh, constitution then, s under this constitution, you see a flowering or a flourishing of uh, constitutional court cases that go way beyond what had been envisioned in 1997 when the constitutional court was imported. So that's why I use this cartoon here. Uh, you see it's written here, Tulak and Piwat, come clean. So within overnight, then the, uh, the uh, judiciary here, with the night all here, the judiciary just completely destroyed uh, the parliament and the government, right? So this is really uh, the idea of what happened, I mean, the, the feeling of what happened uh, in Thailand from 2008 roughly, under the 2007 constitution, until uh, the military coup of 2014. So 
I think, uh, actually, I'm not sure what uh, Dr. Piawut is going to talk about, so um, I don't know if you're going to talk about the um, uh, several cases that happened during that time. So I will not go into details. I will just look at one decision, which was the most emblematic of all the decisions that were taken at that time. It is the uh, decision to prohibit constitutional revision in 2013. So what happened is that you know the government of Yingla wanted to uh, revise the constitution. It was part of uh, the electoral program uh, in 2011. Then they were elected and they went on and tried to revise the constitution to have a fully elected senate instead of a half-appointed senate by a selection committee of seven people. Right. So under the 2007 constitution, seven people appointed half the senate. And those seven people were members of the constitutional, uh, the president of the constitutional court and president of independent organizations. So here, uh, the constitutional court said in 2012 first, and then in 2013, in two decisions, that the proposed constitutional revision uh, is um, is dangerous. It was it will create disharmony in Thailand. So if we have a fully elected senate, we will have big problems in Thailand. And um, so this is. In unconstitutional and so the constitutional revision cannot happen right so this is something that is um, that is unprecedented why so this should be the constitutional scholar telling you this uh, it's because of course when the constitutional court undergoes a process of judicialization which is defined as uh, when the constitutional court goes into the political arena so oversteps its powers and go into the political arena, then the remedy to still have a democracy is to be able to revise the constitution. Right? Uh, so in the end, it's, it goes down to the people, they can revise the constitution and go against the constitutional court if they wish so. But here you see the constitutional revision was uh, forbidden by the constitutional court. So this is the highest thing or the uh, most, uh, yeah, the, the, the the thing that a constitutional can do, which is exhibiting the highest power. And that's why when this happened, it was labeled a judicial coup by uh, the Thai public. Not everyone, but um, at least a portion of the, of the Thai public. So at that time, I, um, I safeguarded, I saved this uh, poster that I found on Facebook. I don't know who shared this, but as you can see, it's 2006, you see on the left uh, here, this old TV and the military coup leaders of 2006, and here you have 2012 here and the nine constitutional court judges. And it says, well, um, here you have a flat screen where in 2012 here you have a, an old TV and they don't have the same uniform, they know it's not the same, uh, but actually it's in the end it, it goes down to the same. It's still a coup, right? So this would be more sophisticated than this that would be maybe more archaic or from, from uh, more from the past. Okay, so how can we see uh, that this process of judicialization of politics with many uh, constitutional court decisions uh, are a self-interested hegemonic preservation? So here I'm borrowing from Ron Herschel. He said, okay, judicialization of politics as a self-interested hegemonic preservation is when the judiciary, so the constitutional court usually, goes into uh, those domains here, which are supposed to be political arenas. So electoral processes, um, the executive and the legislative powers, collective identity, regime legitimacy, and social conflict. So if we look at the constitutional court cases, sorry, I didn't go into details because I don't know how much you, how much you, you know if you've experienced those uh, events yourself, so I didn't go into details, but we have all those arenas that were invested by the Constitutional Court and we can look at, we can just take a few decisions of the Constitutional Court. First of all, electoral processes, we have nullification of elections in 2006-2014, um, in that's what I, I said at the beginning. We have party dissolution, so 2007 and 2008. 2007 it was uh, Thai Rak Thai, 2008 it was uh, Thai Rak Thai as well, but which was reformed and called Palang Prachashun at the time. And so this party dissolution here paved the way for the, uh, the rise of power to power of Abisit Tuchatiwa, which is uh, who is the representative of the opposition. So here it was also labeled uh, a judicial coup because by dissolving the uh, ruling party, it just 
removed the prime minister, who was also banned from politics, and all the ones from the party who were part of the executive uh, board, they had to also be dismissed. And so, change of majority in the, in the lower house, and then we have the opposition coming to power for two years without having uh, been elected, right? So this uh, was also constitutionalized in the 2007 constitution. <coughs> We look at regime legitimacy, regime change. Uh, we have uh, many decisions in 2007 uh, with regards to the legitimacy of the 2006 coup. Actually, I didn't update this, but we have decisions in 2015 and 2016 with regards to the legitimacy of the 2014 coup. And then we also have uh, this intervention to prevent revi revision of the constitution, which is clearly a way to prevent what they see, what the constitutional court sees as a regime change. And finally, we have uh, this as well. Uh, many cases, uh, maybe you, uh, you ask me questions if you have questions about that. Uh, the Samax case, you know about it? Cooking. The cooking show, okay, <laughs> yes, so I removed that, but yes, exactly. So Samak was a prime minister, and then he was famous for hosting a cooking show. He went on his cooking show, and the Constitutional Court ruled that this was incompatible with being a, a prime minister because he had no right to be employed by any, 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 any firm. And so being on this cooking show was being an employee of this firm, and so uh, he was dismissed. And that's how he lost the job of prime minister. Okay, and, and this uh, leads me to uh, self-interested hegemonic preservation. So why do we do we do judicialization? It's when um, we do that as constitution makers, as members of the judiciary, when um, democratization process threaten the old elites. Right? So this is, I take this from Ron Herschel, say, okay, when the interests of the old elites are challenged in majoritarian decision making, then they need the, to resort to the courts. And this is not something that is special to Thailand. This is something that happens also elsewhere, especially here, I put uh, this book, which is, uh, I think, a PhD thesis on constitutional court, their role as hegemonic, uh, of hegemonic preservation. I, Sorry, yes. uh, can you, yeah. it just, uh, has it been off for long? Oh no, just, oh, just Okay, we, <laughs> just there, nothing. Okay, um, so, so yeah, this is a, a book cover, uh, a Turkish, uh, Turkish student who wrote about hegemonic preser preservation of constitutional court in Turkey. Um, all right, and so Rand Herschel identified four conditions that lead to judicialization of politics as a self-interested hegemonic preservation. So here I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, see how this is not uh, peculiar to Thailand. I know that as scholars interested uh, in Thai politics and in Thailand, it, in Thai studies, we always uh, try to find ways to explain Thai politics as um, based on its exceptional exceptional character. I would like to say no, there is no exceptional character of uh, Thai politics. Uh, this is something that happens in many countries uh, in which traditional elites want to delay democratization. So here are the four factors. First of all, election outcomes do not represent the elite's interest. Second, election outcomes bring about possibilities of reg regime change. Uh, third, we have a crisis, and then we have powerful actors that empower the courts. So, all of those conditions are, um, are here. Um, first of all, the election outcomes from 2001 to 2014, the same political party has always been elected in Thailand, right, which is uh, Thaksin's party. Uh, so, they do not represent the uh, interests of the elite. We could talk about this for hours and hours, so I'm not, I'm not gonna go into the debate right now, but for sure, they threaten somehow uh, the, the old order, okay? So they did not represent the traditional elite's interest. Then, you call the book, book cover that you talk about? This is here. Ah, I see, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can, I think, download it for free on <laughs> Pirate's 
website. <laughs> anyway, um, then the election outcomes, they bring about, uh, they challenge state ideology. So this is also something we can debate, but I would argue that they do, because Puyatai is somehow challenging state ideology, especially with the 30 bad healthcare scheme, because it goes, it like reverses the uh, system, which used to be based on charity, the king's charity, fountain of charity, to social justice. And when there is so social justice, uh, of course, healthcare is no longer a charity. It's a right, right? And everyone has the right to ask for it without having to beg. Right? So this is a challenge to state ideology that is quite clear. Then we have the political deadlock that allowed the courts to, to step in in 2006. And then powerful political actors who empowered the courts. So this is the king in that case, because in 2006, when just after the election was nullified, oh uh, no, just after the election was held, <coughs> before it was nullified, and it was like a big vacuum, what's happening now, he held separate audiences uh, to the Supreme Administrative Court judges and to the Supreme Court judges, right? So in two separate speeches to them that he just uh, conveyed for the occasion, he said, well, you have to act. You have to act in my name. If you don't act for democracy, you dishonor my name. And uh, after that, there was a press conference, and a few days later, the courts, the constitutional court, ruled that the election was unconstitutional. So here, it's like Thailand is a textbook application of Rand Herschel theory from A to, to Z. To Z. Right. So I've spoken for about uh, 20 minutes now, so I'm going to my third point, which is that in the future, the constitutional court is going to is at least envisioned as a substitute king. For, um, for the future, so in the post political era, after succession takes place. So I just take, take two informal traditional roles of the king. The first one is to solve crisis, and the second one is to give uh, some validity to changes of government, to new constitution, to coup d'etat through royal signature. Right? So this could be identified as two roles of the constitution of the king. And we'll see that the Constitutional Court is taking on those roles. First of all, you've seen with everything I've said so far that already you can see a sketch of how the Constitutional Court is acting to solve crisis. Hmm? And the chairs, the same, the same chair. And uh, yeah, there's also very, yes, a symbolic, uh, a symbolic of it. So I will be very, very quickly. Crisis powers. Okay, crisis powers. You remember in 2006 when, uh, so when there was this crisis in Thailand, the royalists, they called for royal intervention. And they said the king has to appoint a prime minister of its own liking, of his, his own liking. And uh, they quoted Article 7 of the 1997 Constitution, which states, whenever no provision under the, this Constitution is applicable to any case, it shall be decided in accordance with the constitutional practice in the democratic regime of government with the king as head of state. So they quoted this. The king said, no, this is not possible. But the point is, why did they quote this? It's because they uh, tried to use this constitutional practice, so the idea of a constitutional convention, to apply to, to, um, to invoke the king's role to appoint a prime minister based on precedents in uh, 1973, 76, and 1992. So they did that, and it, it, uh, it didn't work. But actually, Article 7 was first envisioned as giving this power, so the power to interpret the constitutional practice in the democratic regime of government with the king as head of state, to the constitutional court and not to the king. So this is very interesting. First of all, you see that at first, this Article 7 was Article 264, in the first draft, right? And this was um, uh, how it was uh, at the time of, in June 1997. So at that time, Article 264 said that's exactly the same, but that this is the power of the Constitutional Court to interpret and to apply constitutional practice in the democratic regime with the king as head of state. And then what happened? There was a very long debate, very interesting, uh, that you can read uh, if you read the minutes of the, of the constitution drafting process. Finally, that they said, oh my god, it gives too much power to the constitutional court. We have to remove uh, any mention of the constitutional court and move that article somewhere else.
and so they moved it to uh, Article 7. Then, after that, so I'm talking about the power to solve crisis by appointing a new prime <coughs> minister. In 2007, we have an yet another attempt to uh, to give this power to the king, uh, not to the king, to the constitutional court, and this was the first paragraph or of Article 68 at the time, and so I put it here in uh, in Thai as well. So it gave power to the constitutional court to solve crisis, right? To solve crisis in case there is a crisis, and uh, to uh, to have like a, a meeting, to call for a meeting of uh, the uh, president of the courts, the president of the senate, of the lower house and the opposition to find ways to solve the problem. And actually, at first, this uh, article here, this is also, uh, this is um, one document from the constitution drafting process in 2007. This article was envisioned to actually give power to the constitutional court to nominate a new prime minister in case uh, the Prime Minister is removed, let's say by the Constitutional Court, then we would have uh, the Constitutional Court involved in, uh, so the President of the Constitutional Court, uh, and also of other courts, the uh, Supreme Court and the Supreme Administrative Court, the power to choose a new interim government. So here it's very clear, but then it was removed because it was too, it was too clear, <laughs> and so it was removed, and then uh, this paragraph, it became this paragraph, and this paragraph was also removed because in Thailand it created a big uh, uproar, and so there were many debates and civil society groups, and also uh, many noted scholars um, called for the end of this of this paragraph. So in the end, it didn't happen. But now, in 2015, it came back. So in 2015, we have it back in uh, so in the draft in the April 2015 draft we can see that we have those uh, discarded articles all merged together in the Article 7. Okay, so um, we have first of all the Article 7 and then it, it gives power to the Constitutional Court to make the decision. Right? Okay, April, April 2015 is a long time ago already. So here I put the uh, March 2016, which is the same. Uh, I didn't have time to translate it. So uh, just uh, for, uh, for those who can read Thai, so it's Article 5, and you have same once again. Uh, this is the president of the Constitutional Court that in case of crisis is going to uh, call for a meeting of the president of the, of the different courts and so on and so forth to, uh, to find a, a solution. So we have this, this here. These crisis powers that are the traditional powers of the king have been transferred onto the constitutional court. Although if we look at all the, all the drafts, we can see that the, the military also wants to have crisis powers. So we have this fight between the military and the judiciary on who's gonna have the more crisis powers. So first, usually in the first draft, um, one side gave uh, the constitutional court power to solve crisis and then the military, at least that's how I, uh, I interpret it, the military said, come on, we need more um, crisis powers as well. So then we have the second draft that gives more power, crisis power to the military, but then uh, Thai people are not happy with it, so then it just, it, it's just dropped, uh, or it's too, uh, once again, too tip to end, so it's dropped. And then in January, you have another uh, draft by Mitchai that gives much power to the constitutional court, so I don't have time to really uh, go into details. And then uh, the second draft is giving power to the constitutional court, but also to the military to have uh, to solve crisis. And I will, uh, I will, I will conclude with uh, regime change and validity of coup constitution um, by looking at just the um, the revision process in the April 2015 constitution. Well, actually, since um, since the first draft, April until the current draft. Constitutional revision is completely impossible. It's impossible, and so what does it mean? It means that the uh, regime is trying to prevent any sort of um, 
attack by uh, the uh, elected government against the constitution. So this is also this also relates to uh, some form of traditional power of the king to say what is accepted or, or not in terms of changing regime, right? Because here, basically, the constitution is saying that uh, the constitutional court is going to say what constitutional revision is possible or not. So in uh, in April 2015, it had to go. Um, it could be invalidated by the constitutional court in the current draft. Also, the constitutional court can um, has a very important role in constitutional revision. But I don't want to touch on that because maybe uh, I don't what he's going to talk about it. Um, and so, finally, um, we can see that there is this attempt to um, to <coughs> transfer. This, the king's role onto the court, and this was initiated by the king himself, who, to, who told the, the court to do that. So I think I've, I've spoken a way too long, so um, I'm not going to talk about the deep state, um, but I'm just going to conclude by saying that uh, the deep state, this is the legal elites, so the judiciary and the military, that are in, a, in, a, in an alliance with one another, and anticipate, and how do they maintain their power, it's by relying on the barami of the king. And so if the barami of the next king is not strong enough, they will have to find ways to, um, to find new ways of legitimacy, of legitimacy. And so that's why they need to have a constitution that is really institutionalizing their power a lot more than in the past. I will just put it. Um, so I have a lot. Um, so we have the legal elites, we have the military, and they're trying to preserve the deep state. Thank you very much. Everyone, uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the ARC to invite me to this conference, uh, for this conference. And before starting my presentation, I must apologize as my English is not as good as it should be. So I am not used to presenting in English, so I will read a text I have prepared. So uh, my subject is Tulagan Piwat Method and its effect. Since the, the 25 April uh, 2006 royal speech, which led to an increased involvement of the judiciary in the political crisis, the word Tulagan Piwat the word Tulakan Pivat Kraft by Tirayut Bunmi has been used extensively in Thai politics. Many core decisions play a critical role in the crisis. In this, article, uh, in this uh, conference, I will try to conceptualize uh, the word Tulakan Pivat through an analysis of political court ruling since the royal speech on 25 April 2006. Uh, first of all, I, I define the word Tulakan Pivat Uh, for me, maybe I, I think different with Eugenie. Uh, I think uh, the word politi uh, politic politi uh, judicialization of politics is maybe is, is sound a good word, but uh, the word Tulakan Piwat for me, I think is the, is the bad word, is the worst word, uh, is the political instrument. So I define uh, Tulakan Piwat that. I define Tulakan Piwat as a process whereby court play a political role by deciding on case which target political group consider as threatening to the uh, traditional elite region. <coughs> so it's, it's different. Tulakan Piwat is a weapon against politician. Tulakan Piwat is a process whereby court play a political role by deciding on case whose objective is to harm political group considered as threatening to the traditional elite. So for three stages of Tulakan Piwat, first stage, uh, it starts on the Royal Street on uh, 25 April 2006, uh, to the adoption of the 2007 constitution and second state uh, from Smart Song Chai government and the change of government to Apisit and third state, the last government to the 2000 May 
22 May 2014 coup. The three parts of the Rakan Piwa in 2006 to 2007 and 2007 and 2012 to target only one political group, namely the Thai Rak Thai Party, Alam Pashachon Party, Pur Thai Party. The three parts can miss the overtone of the government. So method of the Turakan Piwat. The first one is through interpretation and the second one is through the use of uh, political and moral argumentation in the ruling. Uh, for the first, uh, the creative interpretation of what wording in the constitution. Uh, we, can, we can find many words in constitution, uh, for example, niti tham, jariya tham, kunna tham, and uh, the court uh, uh, interpret of what wording. Uh, there are many ambiguous words in the text of the constitution, niti tham, kunna tham, jariya tham, and the court use this word to interpret extensively in an arbitrary manner. For example, the court has referred the word niti tham in Article 3 of the Constitution to support its intervention in the field of control of constitutional revision, even though it has no power. And second, the use of political and moral argumentation in ruling. Uh, on May 2007, uh, on the ruling on the dissolution of the Thai Rak Thai Party, in the May 2007, uh, the court used the opportunity of the ruling to criticize the election the politician and the Thai Rak Thai party. They have said that the politician are a threat to security. security. And November 2013, on the election of the Senate, in the ruling on the change to an elected Senate, the court clearly made a reference to the danger of parliamentary dictatorship. It is not a legal argument at all. Constitutional revision would make the country go backward we saw some weakness of the uh, Constitution 1997, which would be dangerous to be the unity and the face of Thai people. The Senate would be a house of wife and husband. It would no longer be a wisdom house. <clears throat> so con uh, next one, uh, I would like to talk about the condition of uh, Tulakan Piwat. Tulakan Piwat cannot work alone. There must be other actors and process involved. Uh, first of all, his lawyer speak. Before the 25 April 2006 speech, the court was exerting judicial restraint, especially in political case. It was uh, passive. The royal intervention has changed the paradigm for the Thai court. The Thai people believe that every con conflict must be solved by the court. It last resource. And second, uh, it must have a painful a Democrat party, party opposition, a non-elected senator, independent organization. The court cannot take up a case by itself. There must be a case filled by a plaintiff. There must be a pool of active plaintiffs who find many cases on the same issue from which the court can choose. For instance, the Democrat party, the non-elected senator, and independent organization and the court opened the door which joined to these people and the third the, re the retroactive legitimization of court action in constitution after the royal speech the court has expanded their power without clear legal basis later a legal basis for this intervention will written in constitution for example uh, this uh, the text about the party dissolution. The fact that the violation of electoral law by one member of the, the executive board of the party leads to party dissolution and suspension and ineligibility of the entire executive board was first created by the court decision in 2007 and later constitutionalization on the, the constitution 2007. Other example uh, for the articles uh, 68. The attorney general must screen the complaint first according to the constitution. But the constitutional court said 
the oversight in 2012. Now, the new draft constitution suppress uh, the, the step of uh, attorney general in the process. <coughs> and the last discourse on independence and impartiality of the court. Uh, I think many people in Thailand believe that the court are independent. They are indeed, may I think, they are indeed independent from the government, but not from the, uh, the traditional elite, from the monarchy. <coughs> so, Dulakan uh, Piwat born after the royal speech on 25 April 2006, become a discourse in Thailand. Some issue cannot go to court. In some matter, the court have no power to exercise their control. But Thai society always yearn to the court because Thai people feel that it must be the last, uh, last resort, last arbiter of dispute. In reality, uh, according to legal principle and to the theory of the separation of powers, there are some issues that should not be resolved by the court. There are some issues which are meant to be dealt with through the, through the democratic process. But when the discourse to Lakan Piwat was built, it became generally accepted that all disputes had to be resolved in court. Uh, to Lakan Piwat is a process whereby court play a political role by deciding on case whose objective is to harm political group considered as threatening to the traditional elite regime. Dulakan Piwat rests on the legitimacy of liber liberal democracy according to which there must be a control of elected institution. Dulakan Piwat is the opposite. It seeks to sanction elected institution which uh, represent a threat to the system. The exercise, the, the exercise of uh, Dulakan Piwat took several forms. A direct sanction of elected politician. For example, the case of political party dissolution, dismissal, access, seizure. The second, the protection of its own power. The protecting self competence. For example, the case on, on the blocking of constitutional revision. The third, uh, attack against the legitimacy of the government to pave the way for other intervention of the non-elected branch and the building of the political vacuum, for example, annulment of election in 2006 and 2014. Uh, so I talk about uh, why uh, the Thai Julius is the, uh, con the con uh, conservative uh, royalist Julius. <coughs> So the, the, uh, the international dominant ideology for today is the liberal democracy. When we refer to uh, democracy, we are actually mean liberal democracy, which, which is made uh, of two components. First, uh, democracy, uh, whereby uh, sovereign power resides in the people. Therefore, all state institutions must be accountable to the people. And liberalism, uh, or the rule of law, whereby uh, the power is limited by law. The constitution guarantees rights and liberty and the separation of power. And there are institutions of checks and balance, such as uh, the court or independent organization. Thailand could not remain insulated from the general trend of rule of law democracy. So the question became uh, how to put the royalists into a rule of law democracy discourse. So the, the rise of rule of law in Thailand is mean the rise of Judas. And the rise of Judas is mean the rise of royalist Judas in Thailand. <coughs> uh, first, the role, the, role of doc, uh, the role of doctrine, the law of uh, legal academics. Uh, doctrine had two important roles for Thailand. First, 
put emphasis on the main monarchy at the center of constitutional law, and second, build discourse on political reform. <coughs> Legal academic make the monarchy the keystone of the constitutional law, and build a discourse on political reform. <coughs> I will talk about the the first, uh, the creation on the monarchy as the center of constitutional law. Uh, when liberal democratic ideas spread to Thailand, the kingdom en engaged in a democratization process. A Thai royalist could not escape democratization, yet they managed to end the spirit of royalists in liberal democracy. From uh, 1990 onward, constitutional jurists uh, to build loyalist liberal democracy by placing the monarchy at the center of constitutional law teaching. Constitutional law was made to acknowledge royal power, even though by nature, <clears throat> are intent to limit royal power. Uh, likewise, no credit was given to the uh, Revolution Day, uh, uh, 24 June uh, 1932, nor to the first constitution on 27 June 1932. And the, the royalist students uh, tend to construct a, a royalist constitutional history. Uh, several academics in the field of law play a role in building knowledge in the legal discipline about the monarchy. However, the most interesting case in the case of uh, Professor Bowansak Uwanno, because unlike the author who merely describes the goodness of the monarchy by referring uh, to royal speech, but Bowansak really attempt to build a legal theory of the monarchy. Uh, Professor Bonsa has proposed many theories. <clears throat> Firstly, the monarchy is the center of the nation. He said, in constitutional law, we teach according to foreign principle that a head of state, being a monarch, cannot do anything except when the government forward a text to the monarch for his endorsement. According to the British, the king can do no wrong. What made the British monarchy a symbol of the nation in Thailand, the monarchy is not only a symbol, but also the center of the nation, which play a social role as crisis solver. Therefore, royal power as enshrined in the law is different from uh, the British, because the Thai monarchy is a lot more than the British monarchy. He said that also, uh, if there if there is such thing as a nation state, it's because people in society have a shared imagined common past and a view to continue in the present and the future. If such a feeling is missing, the state cannot survive; it will dislocate. And the Thai monarchy is the institution that binds together the Thai nation. The Thai monarchy is the source of the Thai nation from its ancient origin until today. The Thai monarchy is the sole institution that embody the continuity of the Thai state. <clears throat> and besides this, secondly, Bonsak also built a theory, uh, sovereignty belong to the monarchy and the people. In the Thai system of democracy, sovereignty resides in the monarchy and the people. It differs from other country in which the people are the sole bearer of sovereignty. There are two reasons for this. First, the Thai monarchy has been one which the people and this has become tradition. Second, related to law. From time immemorial, sovereignty belonged to the monarchy. When the Khana Rasadon changed the system of government, the monarchy who had sovereignty bestowed it onto the people by giving them the constitution and accepted to be under the constitution but still had this power on behalf of the people. That is why whenever there is a coup d'etat that abolished the constitution, we should consider that the power that was given with the constitution come back to the monarchy. The sovereign before 24 June 1932 in international law, foreign government, should not recognize the new government because this is an internal matter and the monarchy is the owner of sovereignty. Um, 
he said uh, the People Party cannot last at all, never had legislative power to issue law in the form of a decree or executive order. Thus, the chain of regime in 1932 was a revolution in political sense, but not in the legal sense, as there was continuity between the system of absolute monarchy and the constitutional system through the monarchy. Second, the role of the, uh, the role of a legal academy in building the discourse on political reform to be used by jurists and uh, uh, technocrats. Uh, the movement for political reform emerged after the May 1992 event among the jurists who play an important role in building the discourse on reforming politics through the constitution drafting process was uh, Professor Amon Chantra Songbu. He was former Secretary General of the Council of State and he had influence on the Jewish technician and a group of public law professors in university. Uh, Amon was the, the one who set the trend of public law in Thailand. Uh, many university professors choose, the, choose to study public law in France and Germany. It constitutes a notable shift from the past where Jewish educate in Anglo-Saxon country had continuously dominated uh, the field. Uh, Amon wrote in 1994, Constitutionalism, the solution for Thailand. This work was uh, very influential in the uh, university and the council of state, even though there is no theory at all in it. Amon import uh, the word constitutionalism, which was developed in the, world, in the West uh, to explain with his own formulation that Constitution according to the concept of constitutionalism is a way of writing constitution to decide political institution and administrative mechanism in a way that would mitigate the negative effect that would arise from improper behavior of interest seeking by politician and interest group. Uh, Among thought is as follow: whenever it is impossible to refuse the holding of election. It is impossible to deny right to politician. It is recommended to design a constitution whereby independent organization would check on politician. Amon considered that having a constitution according to the own concept of constitutionalism is a genuine measure of reforming politics and the word reforming politics does not mean revising the constitution only but also revising the constitution and law to address weakness of political institution in the parliamentary system. Uh, Amon believe that uh, drafting a constitution in line with the principle of constitutionalism consists of three components, national political leader, quality academic and people read, the, uh, people read the to understand problem to vote in a referendum to adopt the constitution. According to Amon, the most important condition were there should be national leader. If there is none, then the constitution cannot be born, as the leader should be the one launching the whole process. Uh, with regard to law academic, they were to be involved as a technician in charge of uh, drafting the constitution. And finally, people were to vote in a referendum. Uh, Amon's book uh, prompted Jewish to become technocrat. Before that, Thailand had technocrat in the field of uh, economics. But as of now, technocrat must be Jewish and help decide political institution, draft constitution, and become member of uh, independent organization of check and balance they have uh, themselves a uh, design. The 1997 constitution and the 2007 constitution have created many institutions of check and balance. Those institutions claim they draw legitimacy from their mission of check and balance. Uh, starting with the, the 2000 crisis, it became clear that these institutions were a political force that could gain power in the name of check and balance. Another part I talk about the role of court. Uh, 
the 1932 revolution in Thailand did not affect much the, to the structure of the court. Even though Thailand had new political institutions such as the, the parliament, the government, in the case of court, one can say there was a legacy from the old system. First of all, this continuity stemmed from the fact that the court, the court were reformed during the time of absolute monarchy to escape colonization. Reform that the Canal Sadon continued in order to get rid of the extraterritorial treaty in line with one of the six principles proclaimed by the Canal Sadon independence. <clears throat> the Canal Sadon reformed the structure and the procedure of the court to make it look modern, but did not attempt to change the mindset of the mindset of judge mentality of judge in accordance with the new regime. In the conscience of judge, the court is an institution that is ascribed to an old tradition crafted con continuously starting during the time of absolute monarchy. It is not a new institution resulting from the 1932 revolution. Uh, Yong created Thammasat University in 1934 to produce citizen of new regime. But regarding producing judge, no particular effort was made to change mindset or legal reasoning to make it all compatible with the democracy. And high-ranking judge were judged from the, the old system. Uh, the school of judge was the same system in absolute monarchy, and the selection procedure still rely on close, close mechanism, uh, system close, close mechanism in the name of uh, independence. No other institution could have a say of uh, influence uh, to the judiciary. The monarchy gave a lot of importance to the court. It is visible in, to, in the constitution that state that judge must take must make an oath of allegiance to the king before taking office. They must say, I swear an oath that I will be loyal to the monarchy and perform my duty in the name of the king with integrity. From then, the monarchy will make a speech to provide the king will make a speech to provide both uh, support and warning to judge. If we look in detail into those uh, royal speech, we will see that the king speak, the king speak about justice, which is uh, to be expected. However, the way he is doing it makes judge feel like they are the part of the king. They receive their mission directly from the king. The best example is the, the King Kumipon speech on uh, 25 April 2006. This speech is the origin of uh, Tulakan Piwat in Thailand. Uh, concerning the training of judge, senior judge are providing training to junior judge and instill in their mind that they are part of the monarchy. For the long time, at each training, Sanya Thamasak, he is the ex-Prime Minister after uh, 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 14 October 1973, uh, Sanya Thamasak told new judge that in the group of civil servants, <clears throat> there is only one Thai working in the name of the monarchy. It is the judiciary. We are the only one who work in the name of the king. And Sanya Thamasak also said, if the king order me to do something, I will be happy to do it, even though I must die. Even though it means I must die. <clears throat> uh, through royal speech and legal training, judges are taught that court are upholder of justice. The judiciary believe it is the institution bestowing justice, justice onto people. Just believe that the judiciary is above other institutions. Meanwhile, institutions whose members are elected are seen as, seen as corrupted, chaotic, uh, divisive, and self-interest. Independence of the judiciary means independence from politicians, but does not mean independence from the monarchy. Most with a regard to ideology and interest. Regarding ideology, judges believe they belong to the institution of the monarchy. Regarding interest, judges believe they will be honored by the monarchy in the future. 
of them, the king has appointed retired Supreme, Supreme Court President as privacy counselor. counselor. In time of crisis, the king has appointed high ranking just as prime minister. Today, uh, out of uh, 19 private counselors, mm -hmm. we have uh, five are just notably Tanin Glaivishian, Jamrat, Kemajaru, Atanit, Dikta Amnath, Supachai, Kung, Pungam, and Achan Chai Likit Dikta. Tanin Glaivishian was appointed after the end of his premiership, and for the four after they have all been former Supreme Court President. Uh, before that, a notable who became Privy Council included the uh, Sanya Thamasak Prakor Buddha Singh, Jinda Bunya Kong Jitti Ting Sapat, Sakna Mokama Kun Santi Thakran, etc. The court used legitimacy <coughs> for the conclusion. The court used legitimacy derived from principle of uh, the rule of law and liberal democracy to conduct a mission of preservation of royalism. Ultimately, they sanction elected institution and the people whom they act that are seen as training to the uh, royalist liberal democracy. This can be seen in the case of uh, the many cases of the uh, less majesty and the case of so uh, we so called uh, judicial coup uh, since uh, 2006 uh, or uh, to today. <coughs> So, uh, I, um, for the conclusion, the, the doctrine build knowledge, the doctrine, the, the, the legal academic build knowledge, whereby the monarchy is the central agent of the liberal, the, of a high liberal democracy. The royalist rule of law doctrine has led to the design of new institution to check on the exercise of power by politicians. The court and independent organization conduct the mission to repress right and liberty as an action that are deemed a threat to the system. This institution derives their legitimacy from this cause on rule of law democracy, but they believe in royalist democracy. They use the doctrine of rule of law democracy to suppress threat to royalist democracy. Thank you. So uh, I would say that uh, you, we may have to you know, move back into history and look at the beginning of the functioning of the so-called uh, democratic system in Thailand. And I would identify 1973 as uh, a very important policy story. I think, and if we take that, uh, I, I'm very struck by the fact that we did what is interesting. Talk about the more. And he said, when, when it is impossible to withhold election. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, are we looking at the Thai state as having the, most of the time, democratic system with the intervention of the military crew? Or are we talking about the other form of state being quite powerful, being dominant, which allow democracy to function intermittently? I think it's a big question. And I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to do it down. Mm. <laughs> See these two presentations are self-contained in themselves. <coughs> it's a very clear window to see the distortion of the legal principle in Thailand, as well as, if I may say, the absurdity of the political current political situation in Thailand. I think these two presentations give pretty <coughs> much a clear window to that. <coughs> I would like to make three major points. <coughs> One is to put these two presentations into like historical, if you like, to the wider context. The traditional elite, the traditional elite, they use these two tactics. One is to <coughs> appropriate, and one, the other is to expropriate. That is to say, if we look back since 1932, when the tie of democracy 
claim to the shore. They appropriated it. Okay, they granted it, you know, they claim we say it's very good democracy and it and that. But if it went too far, they expropriated it. Yeah? To be a time as we know. Yeah? They stop it, they put a stop to it. The, the, the period of 1933 to 1976 is a good case in point. Yeah? When the democratic forces like were apparent, like democracy, like people were on the move, they like it. They, they not, not that they didn't like they, 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 did, they like it, but they appropriated it. They talk about democracy and this and that. But when the students went a bit, quote unquote, too far, they stop it. They kill people, as we know. On the football ground, Tamasat, 20, over 70 of them. They expropriated it. But again, this is a kind of attack of war. It's a kind of attack of war. Yeah. They pull one way and they pull the other. After <coughs> Sujinda, which year Sujinda? Sujinda. Sujinda. 92, 92. 92. 1992. It's another example. And you can illustrate that. Okay, like democratic forces became strong. They appropriated, they talk about this constitutional law. That, and then when it went to far, they did it again. And this is, this can be seen, uh, not only the bigger picture of politics in Thailand, but also the weakness. Like uh, Dr. Piyamud and Dr. Eugene talk about. For example, the Constitutional Court. This is, it's sovereignly democratic, you know. <laughs> it will prevent, it will pre it will prevent, it will preempt good data and this and that. But they use it. They use the constitutional court for their own end. The commission election is another case in point. Yeah? It sounds very good, you know, that we may have a free and fair election. And what? How they appropriate the, the works of the, the, the commission election. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am impressed when when Dr. Pierre would talk about Thammasat University that really found it, yeah, to build a spirit of like a like spirit, new spirit, a democratic citizen. Look what had happened today to Thammasat University. I worked for Thammasat for nine years. Yeah, I didn't see much of it, <laughs> and let alone today. But leave that aside. I want to emphasize that. This is their tactics. This is their strategy. Appropriation and expropriation. This is my first point. The second point is, the second point is this. You see, we see the absurdity, how absurd it is when they talk about one thing but they mean the other. We know since <coughs> the coup d'etat, which year? The uh, tax signal. 2006. Huh? 2006. 2006, okay. 2006 to, mm -hmm. to 2016. To, 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 to 2016. We see the polarization in Thai society. Very, really, as never before. In fact, the division in Thai society has been apparent on along has been a part and all along. But this division has been activated by other divisions, like, for example, ideological, economic, and political, <coughs> political aim, and so on. Therefore, therefore we, we are witnessing polarization and division in Thai society. And it has been intensified, intensified, as we know, I don't know whether if you witness, if, if you know, if you have friends in Thailand or you go back to Thailand or that. Uh, when like conflict, the conflict, it happens in every social unit, be it workplace, be it in family, within friend group, like like group, you call it like group, you know, <laughs> they argue, with them, they fight on it, right? like that. Yeah, my own experience is. 
can illustrate that. Not only my own experience, I think it's experience for most people in general. So we have division, regional-wise, class-wise, yeah, uh, profession-wise, and so on and so forth. And this will continue. And this is a dangerous situation. In my view, this is a kind of my premonition. Yeah? And I hope that my premonition, my premonition is wrong. I, I, I wish it's wrong. I wish it's wrong. Yeah? That what's going to happen in Thailand. The, the little remark uh, about the, the Thai Constitutional Court. Uh, back to the past, uh, one, on, one, on, one or two years before the coup d'etat in 2014. Uh, <coughs> We, we we can we can see that the the, the role of the constitutional court uh, was very very active. The constitutional the constitutional court ruled that the, the amendment of the constitution was undemocratic. The constitutional court uh, ruled that the uh, unconstitutionality of uh, the bill to Tilen Bar loan for mega project. The ruling on the illegality to the transfer of uh, a high high service servant, Kun Thawin Pien Si, and finally uh, the Constitutional Court dismissed uh, Prime Minister Ying Lak Chin Wat. But uh, the army uh, staged as a, a coup d'état on uh, 22 May 2014. <coughs> From then, Tulakan Pi Wat stopped to play an active role. The Constitutional Court did not say that the coup d'etat was an overthrow of the administration and an undemocratic cessor of power. The Constitutional Court did not say that the Prayut government, even though he implemented the same policy as the Lak government policy, was unconstitutional. So maybe uh, I think uh, today we can call the, the, Thai constitutional, the Thai Constitutional Court is not the Constitutional Court, it, it, uh, the coup d'etat court, the court for coup d'etat. It is not the Constitutional Court in Thailand, but uh, for a rather world, the Constitutional Court is the, is the, the, the important uh, institution for, uh, for the create liberal democracy, for create the, the, for organize, for, for create the, the, the rule of law, for support the rule of law. But in Thailand, I think is the hybrid regime is the we we, we can we can import uh, any uh, uh, institution for the foreign country for the Western country from for, uh, from the Western country, but uh, we can we can we can also that we can we can change we can change the law uh, of this uh, institution. For example, uh, the constitutional court. I think. Mm -hmm. It's not the constitutional court, it's coup d'etat court. The court for coup d'etat. Okay. So I just, um, first of all, I'm really, really happy to see that, um, I'm just going to use a little bit of a perfect, to see that we really agree. Um, so maybe it's because I read both of you extensively and I really like your work, so it's my, okay, my opportunity to say it. So I completely agree with, uh, with what you said. I just want to show that. So first of all, I uh, about 14 October 1973, exactly. Actually, I think that the deep state was construct was constructed in the 1960s uh, because it's uh, usually in countries where it happens. The deep state is con is built through um, with the help of the USA. So if you look at Turkey, if you look at uh, other countries, even Indonesia, uh, we we'll, we see that there is a strong military uh, influence in those countries building the military as a power against the communism, for instance, right? So that's, uh, I think, also a legacy from the 60s in, in Thailand. And actually, the deep state, this is the authoritarian structure in the, um, at the center of the state, and it allows exactly what you said, I quote you, it's it a state, a type of state that allows democracy to function intermittently. Exactly, so it allows elections to take place sometimes. Right? But when the government wants to challenge the deep state, for instance, um, 
interfere with military appointments or interfere with the bureaucracy or interfere with the judiciary, then uh, the deep state is going to take over the state. So whenever uh, there is a military dictatorship, then the deep state is the state. Right? It doesn't mean the deep state is a unitary actor. Of course, it's just like a state. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an actor that is a, a full of uh, contending fashions, factions and so on and so forth. Right? So 1973 would be the time when we kind of uh, stepped out of this military dictatorship. So we have this happening from 1973 to 1976. Just how, how you pointed out very rightly that at that time it allowed some extent of democratization <coughs> to happen. And then whenever uh, it became too threatening because of communism, basically, or so socialism, then the deep state took over again. And so I think that's what happened also in 2006 and 2014, so thank you very much. And uh, second point, uh, appropriation, of course, this is uh, what happened. Legal transplants all the time. But once I know among quoting foreign doctrines, uh, foreign tools of democratization to say we're doing it for democratization, but then uh, giving a new meaning to those terms for their own uh, hegemonic interest. And a third point is about charisma and barami. I think it's important to talk about barami and not charisma because barami is a, is a specific uh, term and I think in the case of Thailand it's really a question of barami, of how power is actually um, exerted informally by quoting the barami of the king, which is something you, you would not uh, do in other society. In, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's right to talk about barami.